Good morning, church. It is such a joy to be with you. I want to take you into a story that happened long ago in my life. It was a hot summer's day in 1977. My mom, dad, sister, and I had loaded in the car from Eufaula, Alabama, headed to Epps, Alabama to see my grandparents at their farm. And when we got there, uh, we, we were so excited to spend that time with them. Well, it was my chance to feel like Huck Finn whenever I was there, whether it was hunting or fishing or riding horses, whatever. This was that time in the country that just took me back to kind of salt of the earth places. At, but my sister did not enjoy all those things as much as I did, to be, to be clear. And my mom and my dad and I had gone out fishing. My sister stayed back at my grandparents' house, so therefore, and my little brother was not born yet, so I had my mom and dad all to myself in that little John boat on the pipeline pond. It was an incredible moment as I got into that, that boat with them, and I was just a bundle of excitement and energy, and we got out on the water, and we had no sooner got to the middle of the lake or the pond than I had the munchies. And one of the best parts about going fishing in that little John boat of my grandparents was always we would take a cooler with us, and we'd have some cold Coca-Colas, and we'd have some Snickers bars and some little peanut butter crackers. I had already broken into those by the time we were to the middle of the pond. And from there, I, I had had my, my Snickers down and my Coke was mostly gone and, and I was fidgeting back and forth with all the sugar rushing through my body and the excitement of the moment, looking to mom and looking to dad, who was going to catch the first, or actually who was going to hook the first fish that I would be reeling in. I was so excited and my mom finally got frustrated with me moving about, making noise in the boat and, and, and also shifting my weight, my little body at, at six years old, at back and forth in the boat. And until finally she turned and she looked at me and she said, I, want, I need to tell you a story. And she launched into this elaborate story she made up, I'm sure, on the spot about a little boy who was in a boat with his parents on a pond just like this and had rustled back and forth and tipped the boat and knocked her parents and the little boy into the, the pond and the moss had come up around and I'm looking over the side as she tells the story and seeing the moss approaching the boat and moss had come up and wrapped around the leg of the little boy and he had drowned because he had not stayed still on the boat. Now, in my little mind's eye, my mom told it so it had to be true. And that was bad enough, except for the fact that just as she finished the story, my dad stood up because he had a cramp in his leg. And when he did, he also was holding his fishing pole, trying to massage the cramp out. And he got a huge bass right by the boat, hit his lure, and not to miss the trophy bass, with the cramp as he stood, he, he lurched back with the reel and the rod to hook the, this big bass. And when he did... You guessed it. He went right out of the boat into the water. Hot summer day, beginning of the summer, so the water was still cold. And just in shock, he instinctively, he was a, a young man, an athlete, reached up, grabbed the side of the boat, and went to just leap over back into the boat from the left side. But my mom and I did not have time to, to move to the right side to counterbalance when that happened. So we were catapulted, shot into the air, into the lake, and the instant that my little body touched that cold water, the story my mom had just told became abundantly true and terrifying. I could almost, I'm certain actually, that day that I could hear, dun -a, dun -a, in that clear water lake, I knew I was gone. I, I'm pretty sure from the far side I could see a fin moving toward me. This was just a few years after Jaws had come out. And so instinctively, I levitated up somehow and was on top of my mom's back, somewhere around her shoulders, and, and was uh, all the way up uh, above her. And she's treading water, trying to swim, and her little six-year-old son is up on top of her uh, trying to save his life. Because I knew if I got past about mid-back on my mom, I was a goner for sure. My dad was going out to swim over and pick up the tackle box that was floating away and was swimming down at the bottom of the, the pond trying to get to the, the fishing poles that had all gone to the bottom of the lake that belonged to my grandfather. Well, with that, my mom began making her way to the side of the lake and we got all the way there. And then I moved from being fearful of Jaws coming to get me to remembering the number of times we had been to the pipeline pond and right along this, this dammed up side of the lake, this bank, it was pretty steep. I remembered all the, the water moccasins I'd seen on these banks, hanging out on the banks and hanging out on the limbs of the trees. I was terrified. But here's what I learned that day. When a crisis happens, we all have to determine where we turn. 
When a crisis happens, we all have to determine where we will put our focus, our attention, where we will gain our provision and our protection from. And today's scripture is no exception to this rule. We've been walking in a series called Marked. And each week we've had a a different uh, story out of the gospel of Mark where we've had people who encountered Jesus and everything turned in their life as a result of this, this mark that was placed on their life by Jesus. And so today, as we read out of Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 46 through 52, wherever you are around the globe as you watch and and you engage with us in this message, I invite you to stand for the reading and hearing of God's word. Would you stand? Beginning with verse 46 in Mark 10. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, A blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he, Bartimaeus now, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many in the crowd rebuked him, telling him, be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Here's the question I want to begin with today is, is simply asking you this. Is your ask equal to the capacity of the one you're asking You see, the city of Jericho, where Jesus and the disciples and the great crowd have come to, it was where Jesus uh, had been many times before. Actually, the Bible has told us many times about Jericho. They've come here to Jericho. They've crossed over the Jordan River. And from here, they will travel about 18, 19 miles on down southwest toward Jerusalem. They're headed there for Passover. All of Jesus, the disciples, and the great crowd, because that's what every good Jewish person did at Passover. You made this hajj, this trip, this, this journey into Jerusalem for the high holy day of Passover. And as Jesus was making his way there, they crossed over and, and he's, he's going to be walking all the way uphill because Jericho is about 400 feet below sea level and he's going to travel almost two-thirds of a mile up uh, to Jericho in elevation. It's a huge elevation change. It's only about a four-hour walk from Jericho to Jerusalem. If you're in good shape, you can make it in about four hours today. Uh, but there's going to be, it's all uphill the whole way there. This is an important city throughout biblical times, long before the time of Jesus, as a matter of fact. In Joshua 6, we're told that the Israelites first crossed over the Jordan River and the first city they came to that they had to conquer was Jericho. It was here at Jericho where they would be hid in the wall by the, the prostitute Rahab. And she would protect them there. And the next day they would come back and they would march around seven times and finally blow the trumpet and the walls of Jericho would fall. Not only that, but this is the city uh, where Jesus, right after his baptism in the Jordan River, he would go to the wilderness outside of Jericho where he would be tempted for 40 days. And, and, and in addition to that, this is the place where Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan parable. As it says, they were traveling down, a man was traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was robbed and beaten and left for dead. Uh, this, this story comes up over and over. In addition to that, we also know that Herod the Great's winter home, his summer home that is, was in this place. It was where when he wanted to get away from all the busyness of Jerusalem or other places, he had a beautiful home here in Jericho. This was the place of the rich and the famous. As Jesus and the crowd began to leave the city, they encounter this blind man named Bartimaeus who had been begging for some time. Bartimaeus is actually a pretty interesting name because it tells us some things about who Bartimaeus is. Not only who Bartimaeus is, but it also tells us who his father is. 
Whenever you find the Aramaic word, which uh, it was the language of Jesus in the New Testament, uh, the Greek New Testament, whenever you find bar at the beginning of a name, it tells you bar literally means son of. So bar, whatever the rest of the name was, is the son of Timaeus is who Bartimaeus is. And there are lots of uh, names that begin with bar in uh, the New Testament, as a matter of fact, Barabbas, um, Bar, son of, Abba, father. So his name literally meant Barabbas, uh, the one that the crowd cried out for. His name literally meant the son of the father. In Bar- Barak, uh, B-A-R, I, I, he was the ruler in ancient Israel. Barnabas, who was known as the son of encouragement, he helped encourage Paul as he was first called. Barsabbas, one of the two candidates to take Judas's place after he uh, dies. Bartholomew was one of the 12 disciples and Barjona was another name for Peter, literally telling us that uh, Peter's father's name was Jonah, son of Jonah or son of um, the dove, which is what Jonah means as well. Uh, These are just a few examples. I could go on and on about this of of names in the New Testament that began with Bar, but we, we know that Bartimaeus has probably sought help from his father Timaeus early in his life. And then later, Bartimaeus has come to this place where he's been begging for some time. It doesn't, scripture doesn't tell us how long he's been by the roadside just outside of Jericho on the way to Jerusalem, begging and pleading for people to give their leftovers to him, to toss him a few small coins. No problem for the the rich and the famous that would have traveled back and forth between Jerusalem and Jericho, Jericho and Jerusalem. But he's there in a good spot. It's a wise spot to be for this is a place where lots of people would be traveling back and forth. Jesus encounters him with the crowd. And and there's this moment where we recognize that Bartimaeus has been begging from all these other people. He's been turning his help where he sought his help from the rich and the famous and the wealthy that would travel through here. But this day, everything changes for Bartimaeus. Kind of like that day in the lake with my mom and my dad. I I turned for my help to my mom, literally on top of her shoulders and her head as I almost drowned her trying to get my help from her. Bartimaeus turned toward the crowd until he encountered Jesus in this scripture. And the first question I want you to actually respond to online with us in this message today is, what are places that you're seeking help? Where are you seeking help? Both now and in your lifetime, where have you sought help or where have you placed your trust? So I'd invite you to respond even now if you're watching Facebook, YouTube, Roku, uh, or other ways uh, online with us. Hear, Hear the word of God again, verses 47 and 48. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus was a persistent pleader who would not hush up, no matter what the crowd said. These were the same people from whom he would be begging tomorrow if the whole crying out for Jesus didn't work out. Jesus didn't silence him like the crowd tried to do. At least in part, Jesus didn't silence him because he was speaking the truth. When, when he literally cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, he proclaimed a great deal. It, ironically, this blind man Bartimaeus saw more clearly who Jesus was than many of those in the crowd who were following along with him. The, the, the seeing crowd had still their eyes veiled of seeing who Jesus was, while blind Bartimaeus saw much more clearly that he was the Christ, the King, the Messiah King, literally is what he was saying when he said, Jesus, son of David, you are the Messiah, you are the King, the prophesied lineage of David is here and now. The crowd that would, uh, he would have to apologize to later for not hearing what they said, for ignoring what they told him to be quiet. It would be this moment that he determined, I'm going all in with Jesus Because while there would be thousands, maybe tens of thousands that would pass this way across the Jordan, through Jericho, down to Jerusalem for the time of Passover, no one else could heal him physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, and eternally like Jesus. He determined that he would go in all in with Jesus alone. Years ago, Paul Harvey told a great story about a three-year-old little boy. 
And the little boy had gone to the grocery store with his mother before they ever got there. And I've done this. When I, I read this story, I, I kind of laughed this week as I thought about I, I was the little boy in this story. And I've also been the parent in this story. But the mother told the son before they got to the grocery store, do not even ask. When we get to the store, you cannot have any chocolate chip cookies today. So don't even ask. It's not going to happen. Just let it go from your mind. But sure enough, they got to the store and the little boy did fine as they went up and down the produce and the milk and all the different sections until they got to the cookie aisle. And he looked as, they, as she tried to quickly go by, but he saw the chocolate chip cookies on the shelf. And he said, Mom, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? And she said, I've already told you the answer is no, there will be no chocolate chip cookies this day. And he just kind of bowed his head and and as they went on by and she went to pick up other things she got the bread and she got the soups and she got the frozen foods and and she oh there's something back on that aisle I've got to go back through and so she went back by and sure enough had to go by the chocolate chip cookies again and he said mom there they are the chocolate chip cookies are right there can I have some chocolate chip cookies please mom please please mom can I have chocolate chip cookies she said son I told you before we ever got here, before we ever walked into the store, there will be no chocolate chip cookies happening today. So just let it go from your mind. With that, they made their way to the, to the cashier to begin to get ready to check out. And while he was waiting in the buggy, as his mom had the cart filled up with all kinds of stuff he didn't want, all he had on his mind was those chocolate chip cookies. Until finally realizing the moment was passing him by, he stood up in the top of the, the, the little uh, buggy there and he shouted to the top of his lungs, For the love of Jesus, can someone get me some chocolate chip cookies? Well, what do you think? Did he get those chocolate chip cookies? Actually, true story. He not only got a, a package of chocolate chip cookies, but the entire store uproared with laughter and began to applaud uh, the, the boldness of his move, the risk he had taken in this moment. And that little boy and his mother left with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies. Here's what I want to say to you today. It's important to determine where we get our help, where we seek our help, and it's important to recognize how we go after the helper. Hear what I'm saying with this. The question I want to ask you is, how are you getting to Jesus? Let's go back to the scripture. Verse 49 and 50 says it this way in, in Mark 10. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. He's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. Now there are Three huge things that are happening in three different characters in this story. In these two little verses. The first thing I want you to notice is that Jesus did not ignore the cries of Bartimaeus. Twice it says that Bartimaeus cried out. And then when they rebuked him and told him to be silent. He cried out all the louder. But three things happened. First Jesus did three things. He listened. He stopped. And he called for Bartimaeus. The crowd did three things as well. They told Bartimaeus these three things. Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And while it's important what Jesus did and it's important what the crowd said, the part that I want you to really zero in in this message with is what Bartimaeus did. There are three huge things that Bartimaeus does here that I think we can learn from and, and seek to emulate in our lives as well. Bartimaeus did these three things. He threw off his cloak. He sprang up from his seated position. And he came to Jesus. What's so special about throwing off his cloak? Well, I want you to consider that this is the cloak that he would have used to warm himself at night. This would have been his comfort and his shelter. This was the cloak that during the day he would have taken off in the hot sun and he would have placed on the ground and he would have pulled it around as a place to collect the alms or the, the loose change from others as they pass by. This was his collection offering plate, if you will. And not only that, but this was his security blanket at all times. This is the one thing that he knew would be with him day and night. And he throws it off. In his effort to get to Jesus. The second thing is that he springs up. Now any parent who's ever told a child we're going to the dentist. Or we've got to run errands. Or we've got chores to do. Uh, knows the difference between the speed at which a child jumps up. Or gets up. And gets out to the car to run those errands. It contrasts that with the speed when you say we're going to get dessert. 
I, I suspect it's not, the difference is not uh, told with seconds or minutes, but maybe hours. And how long it takes to get everyone to the car when, when you're going to get dessert. That happens so rapidly. But when it's we're going to do errands or going to visit people that they don't want to see. He springs up with great expectation. And the third is that he goes to Jesus. He risked moving through the crowd, the crowd that had hushed him. And blind as he was, he came to Jesus. He listened for the voice of Jesus. He, he moved through the crowd. There was no social distancing at all in this moment. He moved through the crowd and he listened for the voice of Jesus and he went to him. The British missionary William Carey's most famous quote is probably, Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. This is such a meaningful statement to me and to others when you, there's this, this special challenge or this special call that comes in our lives. We, we have a challenge and a call to do something and we, we feel like we're going to do this because we're expecting God to do great things and because we're expecting God to ask of us great things as well. One of my greatest concerns for Christians today is that many expect very little from God and attempt the same. What are you attempting because your expectation is that God will do something great with it? If you're, if you're not attempting great things, it probably has a lot to do with the fact that you're not expecting great things from God either. I would say to you that one of the reasons we served 350 children this last week at seven different apartment complexes in Chalkville School System is because we expect great things from God. I, I, I suspect the reason that we will be doing that again this coming Monday and Wednesday and Friday is because we are expecting God to do great things. Now, we, look, we've got to be careful and wise and we've got to be responsible on that. We'll keep social distancing appropriate. But, but it cannot keep us from attempting great things for God. We do need to be responsible, but we also have a call to be responsive. We have this ability to meet needs. When I heard that they were shutting down schools for the rest of the school year, my mind quickly went to the 80% of children in that school system, in that largest elementary school in Jefferson County, 80% of those kids that are on free and reduced lunches and breakfasts each day. And that it may be the only meals they get. We had to go into action. Now, the responsible part of that is that we're not allowing, if you're over 65, you cannot serve with us for that. That's not us being responsible. It's because of recovery rates there. If there's a need in your life or the, the lives of those you know and love, if you will just email us at need at clearbranch.org, we want to help meet that need. If you're over 65 and you're at home and you don't need to be going out right now, and then you email us at need at clearbranch.org. And if there's groceries to pick up or if there's yard work to be done, we want to be responsive to helping meet that need. If you are under 65 and you're in a, in a less risky category, then we invite you to also email help at clearbranch.org. And there's a way that we'll help connect you together with other people that have those needs where you can be involved. If, if maybe you're watching from home today and there's a deep burden on your heart, a prayer uh, a request on your heart, you don't know who to share it with, email us at prayer at clearbranch.org. We would love, we have hundreds of people that would love to agree with you in prayer. Or maybe you're a prayer warrior and you don't know how to use that gift of prayer. Well, if you'll email prayer at clearbranch.org and say, I want to be added to the list of those that are praying for others. We would love to add you to that list as well. I'm so grateful that some are attempting greater and greater, greater things for Christ. This, this week, this last few weeks, I've seen some folks that have stepped up in significant ways, as Jeremy talked about earlier with the offering, to say, Lord, I have the ability to give at a deeper level right now, and I'm going to choose to do so. I'm going to attempt greater things because I'm expecting God to do greater things with it. Or maybe you're sitting at home and you're longing for community and you're saying, I wish I was in a small group. I long to be in a small group with other people. You can do that online. You can join us by emailing small groups at clearbranch.org and we'll help knit you together. Actually, all of our small groups right now are online. You could join one of those groups and we'd be delighted to help you do so. Finally, I, we're attempting great things this year. We're reading through the New Testament together. and It's kind of what inspired this whole series in the Gospel of Mark is we've just finished walking through Matthew and Mark, the first two books of the New Testament, and we're now in Luke as of this last week. 
And we have almost 600 people that are reading through the New Testament together this year. You can join us. Just go to Facebook, look up the 2020 Clear Branch Reading Plan, and you can walk through the New Testament with us as well. Are you risking great things for God? Are you doing great things for God because you're expecting great things from God? Figuring out where to seek your help is important. And deciding to go after Jesus with everything is also important. It's bringing our greatest expectations for what God can do with the little we give to him. But there's one more question today that I want you to wrestle with in this message. And that is, what do you really want most? What is it you want more than anything else in this world? What is it that you want most in your life? In Mark 10, 51... I want you to hear this single verse. Maybe it's the most important verse of the day. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind men said to him, rabbi, meaning teacher, let me recover my sight. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of blind Bartimaeus in this moment as Jesus says to you, what do you really want most? (laughs) I want you to hear Jesus ask you that question. As a matter of fact, I want to challenge you to post whatever that that answer is in your life. I dare you to post that in, in our group here today of those watching online. What is it you most want Jesus to do for you? In in that boat, when I started out with my mom and dad on the pipeline pond, what I really wanted, I thought most, was to catch fish. But as soon as the boat tipped over, what I wanted most was to survive and thrive. I wanted the protection of a heavenly parent. What is it you want most? And if if the answer for you is too intimate to put out there for the world to see, you can email it to me at vstafford at clearbranch.org and I promise to pray for you by name and for that prayer request specifically. It would be my joy and my honor to do. But if you want it to be prayed over by masses, if you will just post that today, we'll make sure it gets on the prayer chain as well. Yesterday, I had the privilege of interviewing an incredible couple in our church who have shared their story, who shared their story with me of what it looked like for them to cry out to Jesus. And I invite you to watch it now. I'm so honored to be together uh, today uh, via Zoom with Steve and Karen Dickey. Uh, when I got to Clear Branch seven years ago, it was very clear that uh, they were a powerful family, not just uh, in our church, but to the family of God and, and very, very much have become very special to me and my family. And so tonight, or today, I want to ask them three very important questions. Steve and Karen, I'm asking you three very important important questions. The first is this, uh, what were places in your life, in your marriage, uh, where you originally put your trust? I think definitely I put my trust in myself, unfortunately. Yes. I know with my business, it, my business was all about what what I could do. I never prayed for God's guidance and God's direction in my business. It's something that I thought, well, I, I can handle this. I don't, I don't need God for this. I, I've got it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, but a number of years of doing that, that God uh, decided, Hey, it's time. What caused you to finally say, I'm going to go after Jesus with everything I've got and put all my trust in him and him alone. I was running a business and pressures were mounting yeah. and and I started blaming God. I was, I was angry at God because I saw things going in a, in a bad direction and I got really stressed over it. And as a result, um, I made myself sick. Uh, I had a, a condition, uh, a heart condition. Yeah. And I wound up in the hospital. Uh, I was Karen and I wound up moving to Birmingham so that my parents could help take care of me yeah. and they could, I could go to UAB. They could try to figure out what was wrong with me. Yeah. And so, I was on my back for six months in bed. I spent a week in the hospital. Once, uh, once he became so sick, we found out it was an autoimmune uh, issue and that it would just have to decide when it was going to go into remission. So the whole first year I worked those three jobs and I remember I was, I would go from one to the next. I worked six days a week. I, t- I did take Sundays off to be with family. Yeah. But I was on 
Interstate 459 driving down the, the road about midnight coming home. Yeah. And I just was at my wit's end. I was just, you know, it, the pressures were so, so tough and I was so worried about him. And he was just kind of out of it at that time. He was so weak and he couldn't handle anything that was coming his way. Yeah. And I just literally, it was a, a literal Jesus take the wheel moment. I just threw my hands off the wheel and said, Jesus, you have to take this. It's so much bigger than me. I can't do it anymore. I'm just, you know, it was just beyond anything I could handle. Yeah. So I just got this peace the rest of the way home. And then next morning I woke up and my sister had given me Purpose Driven Life uh, about a year right when this started happening. So about a year had gone by yeah. and it had been in the closet. Yeah. And that next morning I got up and I, I went in the closet and there it was in the same bag she'd given it to me. And, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to pick this up. And I did, I picked it up and I started reading it every day. Wow. And they just, these changes in my heart started happening. And I could tell that Jesus was really there mm -hmm. to help me along. Amen. And um, so Steve started seeing the changes in me and he came along behind and, and started reading that book too. And, you know, the rest is kind of history, but it's hard sometimes to, to remember, continue to remember that our trust has to stay in Christ. How do you today continue to put all your trust in Jesus and on Jesus when, when there are days that you could think, look, the business is doing well, life is going well. We know how to do this. We can, can, we got this. How do you keep your trust in Jesus? God has blessed us tremendously. Right. We have a beautiful family. Yeah. I have a, a job that has taken off and it's yeah. only done what it has done because God has blessed it. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard to explain the difference in our lives now in the way it was. Yeah. When we were looking to ourselves, it was an empty feeling. It was an yeah. empty life. Yeah. But now that Jesus is the goal, now that we have our eyes focused on him, okay. everything, everything takes on a different meaning and it's so much more important. And My prayer for all who watch this interview, this testimony, is that whether you are in a season of blessing, that it's easy to see the blessings that you'd realize where they come from, or if you're in that season where you're throwing your hands up and saying, Jesus, take the wheel, yeah. uh, that either way that you'd recognize that, that Jesus is sufficient and he is the one who will give us what we need at yes. more so than anything else can or will. Thank right. you, Steve and Karen, for sharing. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks. In the early days of ministry in the mid-1990s, I was a part of a great movement called the What Would Jesus Do movement. And I probably gave out thousands, maybe tens of thousands of those little WWJD bracelets. And, and it was a great movement. It helped a lot of people consider what Jesus would do as they made decisions. And I feel like a lot of us made better decisions as a result of asking that question. But today, the question I want to ask is not what would Jesus do? Perhaps the, the, best, the best way we could ask the question today is, what has Jesus already done? What has Jesus already done in the lives of others? What has Jesus already done in our lives? What has Jesus already proven to show that he's the one in whom we can place our trust? Let us pray. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for trying to find our help in everything but you. Forgive us for hesitantly and reluctantly coming to you. Forgive us for expecting so little from you and risking even less. For, forgive us for settling for crumbs and leftovers from others rather than seeking the abundance you desire for us. Empower us, God, to place our hope and our trust in you and you alone. And passion us to cast off our security blankets and to spring up from our seated positions in intentional pursuit of you. Help us in this, this season of COVID-19 to use it as a time to draw closer to you than ever before, to recognize that you are ultimately our healer. You are the great physician. You are the way maker. You are the one that can handle everything. And not just everything out there, but everything in here. Help us to seek ways to serve and to care for others rather than selling, simply telling them to hush up like the crowd did with Bartimaeus. 
Give us the courage to attempt great things and the faith to expect greater things still. Give us the willingness to say, even if you don't ever do another good thing for us, you deserve our, you deserve our prayers, our praise, our trust, and our hope. Help us to say it is well with our soul because our hope is in you alone. And in the name of Jesus who has the capacity to meet every need and the desire to do so, we pray this prayer and say amen and amen.